Okay, David, do you want to get started? Sure, not a problem. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the All About Bats webinar. Before we get started, we ask for you to stay on mute and keep your cameras off just so there are no distractions while the presenters are speaking. If you have questions during the webinar, please write them in the chat box. Slide two, please. If you haven't already done so, we recommend changing your view to speaker view so you can see who is talking on the full screen. To do this, you wanna click on the button that says speaker view, okay, at the top of the right-hand corner. My name is David Cowell, and I'm an ambassador and citizen scientist with the Kuchichin Conservancy. Slide three. We'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the territory of the Anosabi, Anishinaabeg, Wendat, and Métis peoples. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties, and we are all treaty people. This webinar is part of our 2020 Adapted Passport to Nature program. Each month, we are offering free webinars and kids' activities that get you and your families out exploring and learning about nature. All of the webinars and kids' activities are made possible by our wonderful sponsors. Please consider supporting their businesses. All of them are local, and they are all doing great work to protect, the na protect nature. Next slide, please. The, the Kuchichin Conservancy is a nonprofit, non-governmental land trust. With the help of thousands of supporters like you, we've been able to protect over 13,000 acres in the Kuchichin Severn region. Hundreds of volunteers help us care for the nature reserves through citizen science monitoring projects, trail maintenance, and much more. This is a map showing all of the nature reserves in our community of volunteers help protect in the region. Many conservancy owned nature reserves are open to the public. And there's a, a total of 13 kilometers of hiking trails. Our speaker for this evening is Toby Rowland, the citizen science field coordinator for the, at the Kuchichin Conservancy. He has experience monitoring for birds, reptiles, and mammals, including mist netting for bats in Guyana, South America. He's been involved in helping set up the bat monitoring program at the Conservancy since 2019. Following Toby's presentation, we'll have Joan Vincent and Roland Rayhorn answering questions about monitoring as bats as volunteers. Joan and Roland are Angela Rayhorn's parents, and it was Angela's idea to start a bat monitoring program at the Conservancy, and it was the Citizen Science Fund set up in her memory which made this program possible. Joan and Roland have been monitors from the very beginning and have had great success monitoring for bats at McIsaac Wetland and Adams Nature Reserves, as you'll see in their video. Please welcome our presenters for this evening. There we go, should be unmuted now. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us for the All About Bats webinar. Um, so this was originally going to be an in-person event uh, with about 10 to 15 people. So it's quite exciting to actually have uh, more people to share this, to share this with. Um, so because we can't all get together at the moment and get out to try out the bat detector, um, what we've done is we've created a video uh, with Joan and Roland um, to, to show you what bat monitoring looks like. Uh, so we went out to the Adams Nature Reserve. Um, so hopefully this will give you a sense of what it looks like to conduct bat monitoring. And it also has the added benefit of you not having to stay out really late and get eaten by all the bugs too. So that's kind of nice. Um, after the video, I will go over some information about bats in general and the species we have in our region. I'll also go into a bit more detail about their ecology, threats they face, and um, how and why we monitor, for, we monitor them. Um, so at the end, there'll be a Q&A where you can ask, uh, ask questions. So we'll start off with the video. Um, and I'm going to ask that um, it's, well, it's a good idea if you, if you turn your brightness up. It was filmed in the dark, so it is a little bit dark at times. Um, and then also if you have your volume up, um, is good so that you can hear the bats too. So I'm just going to go across here and we'll play the video. So here we go. Thank 
We're out here monitoring um, bats to look for bats in different locations and to find out which bats are in different areas around here. We know there's, I think, eight species, eight species in, in our Ontario. area. And uh, there's four, four at-risk species. So there's the, uh, the northern myotis, the eastern um, Littlefoot. little-footed myotis, the tri-colored myotis, and the little brown, yeah. and the little brown bat. We monitor bats um, by going out about a half an hour after sunset, which is the best time. Um, generally, it's best to monitor when out without any uh, moonlight or anything like that. Um, and we also use the iPad with uh, a program and uh, a device called the echo meter. And the echo meter picks up the frequency of the bats. So, along with that process, we also use uh, a program, the Avenza uh, program, which will also track the location of where we found the bat. So when we start monitoring, we, we um, just walk a path that's designated to us, a location. And when we hear a bat um, through, through the iPad, we will stay in that location for a minute and record the uh, data from that on the events of program and then keep moving forward until we hear another um, bat and follow that process until we're, we've completed the, uh, the um, area that we're monitoring. And, and the iPad will pick up the sound um, of the, the echo location as the bats uh, looking for insects and it will identify it to some degree um, and then it's sent off to confirm the actual identification of uh, which bat that actually is because they all make different sounds to identify them by. The problem is, is that many of the bats are disappearing because their habitats are disappearing. Um, they um, have a disease called um, white nose syndrome, um, and uh, that's um, those are two of the two of the things that are problematic for bats. In fact, that there's less uh, insects for them to right. eat because of pesticides. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people complain about bats and think that, and I think they've gotten a bad rap over the years, and we were probably some of those people as well. <laughs> but uh, bats are important for the environment, and uh, they, uh, they help um, gobble up the insects that are currently flying around our head. <laughs> and also uh, the pests that um, inundate the farm. So they're important to the agricultural industry as well. I think people don't know the bats are pollinators as well. And uh, um, not maybe specifically in Ontario, but in some of the southern countries, they pollinate some of the things that we really like to eat, which I believe are mangoes and bananas and agave, which, you know, if you like tequila. <laughs> um, and they are, uh, I think there's, I think I read there's about 530 uh, um, species that they pollinate. So out of the uh, bats that are uh, within the region, um, some will migrate south over the winter months and the others will will stay here and find a, a cave, a den or anywhere to hide. Big brown. Nine 
56. It's too bad I can't get a picture of, of you in the dark because you'd be shocked at the amount of bugs. <laughs> I can, <laughs> I can hear them. Okay, so um, I hope that helped everyone to get a, an understanding of what bat monitoring is like. Um, and if you have questions for Joan and Roland, um, you can put them in the chat and we'll, we'll go to them at the end. Um, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through and uh, go through a bit of detail about uh, bats in general and go into some more detail about what uh, Joan and Roland were talking about in the video. Um, yeah, so I'll start off with the basics. Um, bats are in the order Chiroptera, and they're the only mammals uh, that are capable of true flight. Uh, there are more than 900 species of bats worldwide, um, second only to rodents in the number of species. Uh, they live on all continents except for Antarctica and have made it to most, most islands as well. So I just want to clarify as well, most people think that bats are blind, which is not true. Um, they can actually still see, but most of them use echolocation as well as sight. Um, so bat echolocation is a rapid series of high pitched frequent, high frequency pulses uh, that they make. And then they listen for the echoes bouncing off of nearby objects. Uh, you can kind of see in this graphic here, the idea. Um, and then that allows them to get a sense of the size, shape and texture of, of what they're going for. Um, and echolocation only really works well at close uh, distances um, because high frequency dissipates quickly. Um, so this is why bats look like they kind of fly erratically all over the place. Um, it's because they're reacting to a nearby environment. Um, so they're also not out to get people. Uh, a lot of people are, get afraid of bats because of that. So I just want to say as well, um, they're really good at navigating. And the last thing they really want to do is, is run into a person. Um, so if they are flying around a person, it's generally because they're trying to get the insects around you, which is um, actually uh, kind of a good thing <laughs> rather than being a bad thing. Um, and a couple of other interesting things too, uh, compared to their body size, um, most bats are very long lived. Um, so they're, you know, the size of a small mouse or something, but um, on average, uh, they, they live over 10 years um, for the smaller species, um, which is a long time for something that small. Um, and they can range in size from the bumblebee bat, uh, which is about half the length of your thumb, uh, to the golden crowned flying fox, um, which can have a wingspan of over five and a half feet. Uh, so they're quite a variable group of, of animals. Um, so I'm just going to put the laser on as well. There we go. Um, so bats are a very diverse group of mammals and have evolved to fill a variety of ecological niches, uh, from eating fruit and pollinating, pollinating flowers to feeding on fish, insects, reptiles, amphibians, small birds, small mammals, and, and even blood as well. Um, so they, they cover a, a big uh, group of uh, niches there. The more we find out about bats, the more we see how important their roles are within the different ecosystems. Um, so there are a lot of things that we like to eat that wouldn't exist without bats, uh, from agave to bananas, avocados, mangoes, uh, lots of other different things as well. Uh, and they play an important role, uh, again, in pollinating, as you can see in this picture here of a gray-headed um, flying fox. 
Um, and then also dispersing seeds. This is an Atibia species from South America, um, eating seeds that they'll disperse, and then feeding on insects. We've got a hoary bat here um, from this region, um, and they're an insectivore. So they're, they're, they're really important for a lot of different reasons, um, besides just being important for themselves. Um, so we'll go into a little bit of bat ecology. Um, so the group we have here are a group of micro bats um, and the small insectivorous species. Um, and they're in this group, the Vespatilianidae, which I, I might have said right, but we'll see. Um, and then uh, they all look quite similar and they play a similar role um, and, uh, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the region. So they're all small insectivores. Um, most of the bats we have here are crepuscular, which means that they're active at dawn and dusk. Although we do have a couple that come out when it's a bit lighter, so before, before sunset and um, into the morning as well. And then we have a couple that hunt throughout the night as well. Um, so I just wanted to show you as well, um, oh, there we go, uh, a picture here of some um, trees. So uh, in the summer during the day, uh, bats will roost in a variety of different places with each species having its preferred habitat. Uh, so when I go through the different species, uh, we'll talk about a little bit of uh, about their specific prefer preferences. Um, but here's some photos of some potential sites you might see um, when you go for a walk in the woods next. So these were taken at Grant's Woods of just a few trees that looked like they had good bat habitat. So you can see here, we've got lots of crevices um, and things like that that bats might like to go into. Uh, and then again, the same here, we have crevices uh, and then a bit of a, a, a hole here that they might crawl into. Um, so they'll be hiding in areas like this. So if you keep an eye out when you're looking in, in the woods, uh, you might see these kind of places. Um, again, under this kind of bark um, and, and in a hollow tree like that, they might go into. Uh, this one's actually a bigger hollow, so the hollow could go high up into the tree, uh, and that would be uh, possibly a, a, a bigger roost of, of bats in that area. Um, so that's another kind of place you can look out for. Uh, and then some bats will even just wedge themselves um, in under peeling bark and things like that. Um, there are some bats that like to hang in, in, the, in the leaves of trees. So they'll be, you know, kind of midway up in the trees, just hanging on the leaves. Uh, and then other bats like to crawl into the crevices of rocks. Um, so if there's, you know, Canadian shield rocky areas, they might crawl into, the, into those uh, rocky crevices too. Um, some bats will also use um, buildings, um, barns, uh, and, and structures like that as well, bridges. Um, so in this area, we have five species that hibernate, um, usually in caves and mines uh, or buildings. And then we also have uh, three that migrate south for the winter. Um, so just to give you a quick sense of the species we have here, we've got eight different species. Uh, the top ones here, the hoary, eastern red, silverhead, and big brown bats, uh, they're not at risk but they do have things uh, like on the species at risk list anyway, but they do have um, threats that they face. Uh, so we'll go over some of those in a bit, uh, but the tricolored, little brown, northern long-eared and eastern small-footed, uh, they all have uh, complicated names. <laughs> but um, yeah, so these ones, uh, they're all affected by white nose syndrome, which we'll go over a bit later, um, but they're federally or provincially endangered. Um, and that has happened in the last 10 or so years. Um, so we'll, we'll go over that as well. Um, so we'll just go through each of the different bats we have in the area. Um, so the first one we'll look at is the hoary bat. Um, and this species is the largest one we have in the region. Um, and it can have a wingspan of up to 18 inches. Uh, so it's quite a big bat. Um, and it's called a hoary bat because of this uh, frosting uh, on, the, on the tips of its fur. So it feeds later than most species, um, up to five hours after sunset. So this is the one that will go through the night. Um, and it's a widespread species that can be found from Canada to South America, uh, Galapagos, and even Hawaii. Um, and they, they, this is one of the ones that likes to roost uh, by hanging in the leaves of trees. Um, they also have low maneuverability. So that means that they feed in open habitats, forest edges, and over uh, big, large bodies of water. Uh, and this is one of the migratory species. So they can travel long distances to overwintering sites, uh, even as far as South America. Oh. And then uh, for each of these that we have a recording for, I've, I've included that as well. Uh, so you can hear what they sound like too. So 
So in that uh, clip, you could see the frequencies down here at the bottom and then kind of the loudness of it at the top. Uh, and you'll notice as we go through that, that each of the bats sound quite different. So you can see how they're differentiated um, and uh, identified. So the next bat we have is the Eastern red bat. Um, so this one is one of the easiest species to identify if you find one roosting um, because it has the you know, bright orange to red fur. Um, and its main food is moths, which it catches in the air. Uh, and they can eat up to half their body weight in two hours, uh, which is quite impressive. Uh, so people, people have been known to think these bats are attacking them because they'll dive after insects that uh, hide on the ground, um, but they're actually just hunting, um, not people, insects. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about it if you see them kind of coming down towards you. Um, and like the hoary bat, this species also prefers to hang from leaves uh, when it roosts in the day, uh, usually in deciduous trees, but obviously this one you can see is also on a cedar. Uh, so they just kind of hang there during the day um, until they, and then they drop down and fly off at night. Um, so this species also has um, furry ears and a furry um, tail. Um, so that's just to keep it warm as well. Uh, and the females will have a bit more of this frosting uh, on the tips of its fur. Uh, so this is another migratory species we have. Um, and they usually fly down to areas like the Ohio River Valley um, to overwinter. And this is what they sound like. Okay, so the next one we have here is the silverhead bat, um, and it's actually this middle one. Uh, I'm not sure on the, on the ID of these ones, it's very hard to tell, uh, but this middle one uh, is a silverhead bat. Um, and so for this species, the females uh, generally uh, are said to migrate further north than the, than the males, um, and, and they prefer to roost in the bark and hollows of willow, ash, and maple trees. Um, so this is a highly maneuverable species. Um, so apparently they can look like a giant moth um, when they're flying around. Uh, their preferred food is uh, flies, beetles, and moths, um, but they are opportun opportunistic feeders, so they'll feed on a, on a variety of different things. Um, this is the other migratory species we have and will travel down to the southern United States in late October. Uh, and this one, you can hear what it sounds like too. And you'll hear it, it kind of goes buzzy at the end, and that's when it's actually catching an insect. Um, so I'll point that out. So that's that bit where it sounds like an insect. And again, that bit that you could hear that kind of went higher pitched here, that's when it's moving in and, and catching an insect. Um, so the next one we have is the big brown bat. Uh, this is the one you're most likely to see and it's the most common uh, to find in houses. Um, so during the summer, the males are solitary and the females have colonial maternity roosts. Uh, so this is actually a maternity roost um, of, uh, and then around the corner we had, there was a male as well, uh, but this was in the eaves of a house. Um, and so if you have bats in the eaves, they're most likely big brown. Uh, and again, the males will be alone, the females will be in this group with their young. And they're a beetle specialist. Uh, so they feed on a lot of crop pests, and so they have a big impact on, uh, on agriculture. Uh, and so this species is the most likely to hibernate in your house, um, either in the attic, the walls, or in your basement, uh, but they'll also use caves and, and mines as well. Uh, and this is what they sound like. Uh, so the next one here, we've got the tricolored bat, um, and it's not named for the colors on the bat. Um, like it's not got three cut different colors on it. It's actually the individual hairs. So um, they're dark at the base and light in the center and then uh, dark at the end. Um, so it's a little bit of a misleading name. Um, 
They leave the roost sites earlier than most other bats and can sometimes be seen flying around among chimney swifts before it gets dark. Um, they're also efficient predators and apparently can catch up to an insect every two seconds. Um, and they can eat up to a quarter of their body weight in half an hour. Um, they mostly eat flies, leafhoppers, and beetles, which they catch in the air. Um, we're also at the northern ed edge of their range. Uh, it gets a bit too cold a little further north. And there's also a patchy distribution of hibernacular that they can use in the Great Lakes area. So they're quite a, a rare species in, in the area. Um, they also hibernate in warmer caves and mines hanging from the walls, uh, and then they hibernate further apart from each other than other bats in the area. Uh, so they'll kind of be individually scattered around. Uh, and this is what they sound like. Uh, so the next one we have here is the little brown myotis. Um, and so this one is the uh, most common of the species at risk that we're finding. Um, and so it used to be the most common uh, bat species in the region, um, but they've had drastic declines um, because of white nose syndrome, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but when white nose syndrome gets into a, into a hibernacular, it can actually have a, an impact of um, a decline of 90% uh, in that specific one, sometimes up to 100%. Um, so it, it's a really uh, drastic disease. Um, but yeah, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, they're also a classic case of why we, we need to monitor for common species as well as species at risk. Um, so the little brown myotis used to be the most common. Um, and so no one really monitored for them because they didn't think there was a need. Um, but now we can see there's obviously a, a drastic decline. Um, but we don't have any, we don't really have as much before data um, when they had healthy populations that we can then compare the information we have now. Um, so it just goes to show that even if something seems common, it's still important to monitor for them. Um, so this is actually a, um, an example of a long lived species. So uh, they're really small, about the size of a, of a mouse um, in weight, but they can live up to, thir uh, up to 33 years in the wild. Um, so they're really long lived uh, for their size. Um, they hibernate in high numbers uh, and they cluster in mines and caves. Um, and this is a major reason why they're vulnerable as well, because they all come to one, one space and they can get uh, infected there. And this is what they sound like. Okay, so the, the next one is the northern long-eared myotis, or sometimes just called the northern myotis. Um, and this one is, can be distinguished by its long ears. It's longer than, uh, than the ears of similar species. Uh, we don't have a recording for this one. This is what we got last year when, before we had the echometer. Um, and this is what the Ontario Land Trust provided, uh, kind of showing that it was this species. Um, so, the, uh, they're one of, usually one of the first to, to leave the hibernation sites and one of the first to come back. Um, and they usually prefer rocky areas to roost in rather than trees. Uh, so their main prey are things like beetles, leafhopper, leafhoppers, flies, and flying ants. Um, and they're resident species that hibernate in caves and mines in the area. Uh, so the last species that we'll have a look at uh, is the eastern small-footed. Um, and this one, uh, it is called the small footed because it has small feet compared to other species in the area. So that's a good identification one, uh, a little bit easier than say the tricolored, which is a bit confusing. Um, but yeah, so this species uh, can to tolerate colder temperatures and hibernates individually on the walls or under rocks in the caves and mines. Um, and they usually only travel a short distance between hibernation and summer roost sites. So usually not more than say 40 kilometers between their summer and uh, hibernating sites. Um, they also prefer to hibernate near the entrance of caves uh, where it's a bit cooler and drier. 
um, which means they're likely a bit less affected by white nose syndrome, uh, which needs more damp conditions to thrive. Uh, so yeah, we'll spoken a bit about white nose syndrome, so we'll we'll talk about that now as well. Uh, so here, there's some conservation issues facing bats. Um, one of them is is habitat loss. Uh, the same way as as many other species we have, um, habitat loss is a, is a big uh, thing to impact them. Uh, but more specifically to bats, is things like uh, eviction from roost uh, roost sites. So that's uh, weatherproofing of houses, uh, taking down old buildings or barns, um, and also uh, closing up um, mines and things like that. So we'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, white nose syndrome, though, is a as a white fungus that grows on them while they hibernate. Uh, it grows on exposed skin, as you can see here, it's on its wing, uh, it's on its ears and its face, uh, which is why it was called white nose syndrome. Um, and it causes the bats to wake up during hibernation, uh, using up the fat reserves that they need for the winter. So if too much of their fat is used up, they'll starve uh, before they can feed again in the spring. So it does, that's kind of the impact that it has on them. Um, and you can see here on this map, uh, that the first case of white nose syndrome was here in New England in 2006, and it came, o came over from Europe. Um, and then since, since then, it's spread across a lot, of, uh, a lot of North America, and this was for 2019, so it's probably spread more this year as well. Um, and from the map, you can see that it reached our region about 10 years ago, and, and we've had drastic declines since then, so it's definitely having an effect. Um, so the affected species are eastern small-footed, little brown, tricolored, and northern long-eared, which are those ones that are endangered. And apparently the eastern red and the silver head can be carriers as well. So there's a couple other things that um, impact bats specifically. Um, one of them is caving. Uh, so they have very specific hibernation requirements. Um, so thousands of bats from a huge area might use one hibernation site. There might be one good cave in, in, in an area. Um, so it's easy for white nose syndrome to spread on the clothes and shoes of people who go uh, into caves. So you have to be really careful about that. Uh, it's also easy for an individual or small group of people in a cave to disturb bats while they, um, which will make them use up the, the fat reserves. So it's similar to white nose syndrome where if they wake up, uh, they might not have enough energy to to then feed in the spring. Um, blocking off cave and mine entrances can also cause major problems for bats because it stops them accessing their sites. Um, sometimes people will put bars across so bats can go in but people can't um, because they close them up because they're dangerous for, for people going in them. Um, you know, you can kind of fall into it. Um, so yeah, the, those are some of the uh, things affecting bats in terms of caving. Um, another thing that is important is pesticides, which can bioaccumulate. Um, so that's, that means that when insects eat a crop treated with pesticides, uh, the toxins build up in their bodies, and the insects uh, are then eaten by the bats, where the toxins are stored in their fat reserves. So each time the toxins go up a level in the food chain, uh, they become more concentrated. Um, so you can see kind of here, say the uh, pesticide was put onto onto the crops and then the insects ate them and it builds up a bit more in them. Uh, the bats eat a whole bunch of insects and then it builds up in the bats um, as a higher concentration. Um, so the fat reserves are then used up in, during hibernation or migration uh, and that's when bats uh, start to show signs of poisoning. Um, the toxins can also accumulate in the milk and affect the young when they're being weaned um, and they start using up their own fat reserves. Uh, again, they can start showing signs of poisoning at that point. Um, so there's quite a few conservation issues, um, and that's why we want to monitor for them. Uh, so we'll go into that now. Um, so there's a few ways that you can monitor for bats. Um, the old fashioned way <laughs> was to shoot them. Uh, so luckily we don't do that anymore, um, but that was the only way that they could kind of figure out what they are. Um, so now we have better methods. Uh, we can do visual surveys if we know what species they are. Um, at a roost site, as they're flying out, we, you, know, you can count them. Um, also, uh, you can go, uh, people can go into mine, mines and caves and things like that and do a, a count of hibernating bats, uh, as long as it's done carefully. Uh, another thing that you can do is use mist nets. Um, so these are a fine net that's set up um, 
for bats to fly into, and they can be set at varying levels, you know, different heights uh, to get different species. It can be quite stressful for bats, um, but it is the only way to, to allow for certain in-depth studies to be done. Um, and it is the way that, that we managed to get all the recordings of known species for the uh, ultrasonic um, monitors to use as well. So it does have, it is important for certain methods, uh, for certain things. So the next one uh, is the ultrasonic methods. Uh, so bat detectors will pick up the bat echolocation calls and match them to a library of known calls to give you a species ID. Uh, so that you can get stationary units like this one, which you put out on a tree or something else, uh, and you leave it for a season or a few days or a set amount of time. And then you analyze that information, all the bat calls that it recorded over that time. Uh, the other one you can do is a handheld detector. Um, where you find bats along a set route. And that's what we've done. Um, so the way that we've monitored for bats is last year we used the Piasonic, which is an older unit. And it worked well, but we did have a couple of technical issues and we had some trouble um, uh, figuring out when we were actually hearing a bat. It was a little bit harder to tell. Uh, so this year we're using the Echometer Touch 2 Pro with, the, with an iPad. So you can see here, this is what you attach to the top of the iPad, and then you open the app, and uh, we'll, we'll look at that in a second. Um, so using this technology, you have one person using the iPad and listening for bats, and the second person is using a Benza to map out where, when, and which species are detected. So the detector also shows an auto ID on the spot, uh, which gives a, its best estimate of, uh, of which bat it is. Um, so, we also wanted to make sure that uh, what we got from the detector was uh, the right information. So we're also sending off to the Ontario Land Trust Alliance, and they're going to give us a de definitive result of what we found at each site um, once, once they've analyzed it. Um, so I'll just quickly show you here what it looks like when you plug the um, echo meter in. So you plug the echo meter into the computer, and then it asks you if you want to allow it to, to, to use it. And then all you do is you're out in the field, you press start, you record it down here, you walk along, you do your transect, it picks up the bats, it records them, it tells you what it thinks they are as you go around. And then when you're done your monitoring route, you press this one again, it stops the recording, and then you press stop, and then you can close the app, and all that information will be in there, and we can pull it out later and map it. So then, the next thing you'll do is the second person will be out there with Avenza and they'll go through, they'll select the map that they're using. Uh, we always make sure that people put tracking on so no one gets lost in the middle of the woods. Um, and then we'll also have them uh, go through and every time a bat is heard on the bat detector, uh, they put in the time and the species that was heard. So in this case, they may have heard, it looks like a hoary bat. And then uh, if they go along and they hear another species, they mark it in that location and they put the time and the species down. And that way we can map it. So then they'll send us a file. So they'll send us this file. We'll have the iPad with this information on it. And with both of those, we're able to um, go through and map it out. So you can see here, uh, this is what we're able to make with it. Uh, so this is the information that we're able to get from the monitoring visit. Um, it shows us where the bats uh, are active at, which, um, at that time, and it also gives us an idea of how best to manage uh, a property in order to help the bats. So this is actually where the video was taken. This was the route that we did, uh, but this was from 2019. Um, so at this property, we can see there are a few observations in the forest down here. So this was the northern long uh, and which likes um, rocky crevices, which there are a lot of rocks in here. Uh, and then there's also the, um, nor uh, the uh, little brown myotis. Um, so it gives us a sense of where they might be coming out of their daytime roosts. And then up here, you can see that they're using the open water for feeding as well. So we get a real sense of where the bats are on the landscape. So you can see here in 2019, we had uh, five pilot projects, uh, sorry, five pilot sites. and um, we had the little brown, which is the pink one here, at four different sites. Uh, so that's an endangered species. And we had the northern long-eared up here as well. 
Um, and then we had a lot of the other species as well. So um, these ones we have had analyzed. So these are species we definitely found. Um, and then this year we did some, some more scouting at certain, at a few different other places. And we found a few other species. Um, no northern long eared this time, but we did find the tricolored bat. Um, but again, all of this needs, still needs to be sent to, to Alta, the Ontario Land Trust Alliance. Um, and so this, these species lists may change, but at the moment, this is what it looks like we, we likely have. Um, but we'll, we'll see what they say once it comes through. Um, so what will we do with the information? Uh, we, we will uh, send the information on to the Natural Heritage Information Center. Um, because bats are very deficient in data, there's not many people out uh, monitoring for them. Um, so the NHIC is the government uh, body responsible for compiling and organizing species at risk information. So they, um, the more they know, the more they can map out distributions and find out which species that are declining and where they need help. Um, so before 2019, the uh, Conservancy knew there were bats on the properties, but could not say, you know, which which species they were until we started looking for them. Um, and so once we knew what species they are, uh, then we could start to think about um, what needs they have uh, for management. So we can figure out which habitats they're using um, and make management decisions uh, based on that. Uh, you know, we might find that they're relying on an old building. Um, so maybe we should put up some bat uh, boxes before we take it down. Or we could might be hearing them a lot in the beginning of the season in a certain area, which could mean there's a high binocular nearby. Um, so those are you know some important things that we can find out. We can also let nearby farmers know um, how they can help build up bat populations, uh, which could reduce the amount of pesticides they need to use. Um, and also we could let local landowners know which species of bats they have nearby uh, and give them the best practices for managing their, their forests with bats in mind. Um, so lastly, what can you do to help bats? Um, one of the main things is, uh, is to educate yourself um, and inform others about bats. Uh, they're a misunderstood group of animals, um, so um, that, that's a really important thing. Um, some of the other things you can do is to help us protect their land, um, help us protect the land that they use. Um, every time a piece of land is set aside for wildlife, uh, we're helping to reduce the amount of fragmentation and habitat loss uh, that affects so many species. Um, so there are lots of you know people around that are protecting land and there's parks and all of that too. So any protection of land for wildlife um, is always going to be a benefit. Um, so if you have a property uh, with potential bat habitat, you can also make sure to manage it in a way that maintains or increases the ecological integrity uh, for species like bats. So that's leaving things like snags, which are old dead trees, uh, which might have a hollow in them, uh, and things like that as well. So there's certain things you can do. Uh, lastly, you can provide um, bats and allow bats to live in your home. <laughs> um, they don't cause damage for the most part, uh, and for the most part, people don't know that they're, um, that they're even there. Um, so all they're really doing is using the parts of the house uh, that you don't use. You know, they're using the walls or the attic, um, and not many people really go in those. So. Um, that's one thing you can do. <laughs> Another thing uh, is if you don't want bats in your house, which is also understandable, um, just make sure to hire someone who's professional, um, who, will, uh, who will exclude the bats humanely um, by sealing up the gaps and installing a one-way door so that the bats can still escape through the door, but they can't get back in. Um, and you also want to make sure that they're doing this at the right time of year. So that's usually in August or September when the young bats are ready to fly by themselves and they can get out and fly off by themselves. Um, so there's definitely uh, resources you can use like this bats, a conservation guide from the Toronto Zoo or things like bat management best management practices for bats um, from the Halliburton Land Trust, um, which have that kind of information. So you can you know, if you do contact someone, you can make sure that they're following all the guidelines that you're seeing in these kind of documents um, to make sure that it's being done properly and, and you're not getting bats stuck inside your house. Um, and so lastly, I wanted to thank Angela for being the inspiration for this program. Um, we all now know more about bats um, because of her passion for conservation. Um, so likely most of us wouldn't have known this much about bats uh, without her. So. Um, 
yeah. So now we'll, we'll go to questions. So if anyone has any questions, I think Joelle is going to go over that, uh, have a look at them and, and ask some questions. Um, so yeah, I'll turn it over to Joelle now. Yeah, so we've had a couple questions come in. Um, the first one, so this can either be for Joan, Roland, or Toby. Um, it's from T, and it says, my son, age five, would like to know where the bats go in the winter. I, I, I can answer, or if you guys want to jump in, you can. You might just have to take yourself off mute, too, if you want to answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can probably take this one better than that. <laughs> sure. So, so yeah, it's, um, so they will hibernate in, uh, in things like um, in caves or uh, in an attic or in the walls of your house. Um, but they'll just be sitting there that you don't have to worry about them. Um, but they, what they do is they, in the winter, they have all that fat that they've stored up and they basically go to sleep for a really long time. Um, so they go, they'll sleep for months on end um, in, in cool places, uh, you know, quite cold um, places like caves. Um, and then some of them will fly down south. So they'll fly, same, same as birds, they'll fly down to the, you know, South America or they'll fly down to the Southern United States. Uh, so they'll make that long journey down there and some of them will still even hibernate down there, but it's just not as cold. So they don't need to hibernate as long. Um, so there's a couple different things they can do in winter. Yeah. Um, so another question we have, who is, oh, what is also from T, um, how much do bat monitor units cost? Are non-scientists allowed to buy them and use them? Uh, we live on the edge of the forest and have many, many bats at night off of our deck. Um, I'll partially answer this one. <laughs> sure. um, anybody can buy the unit itself and you can likely use a, a phone, but definitely an iPad um, to do the monitoring. So that's not a problem. And if I'm not mistaken, they're probably in $300 mark. Yeah. So it depends. We got the, the Echo Me to Touch 2 Pro, which is a bit more accurate. Uh, and that one, I think, was ended up being it was 350, I think, US. So it was it got up there a bit more. And right. then the other one, the the non-pro one, which is also great if you're just going out and monitoring for bats. I think it was in the 250 US dollar range. So uh, I don't know what the exchange rate is now, but it would probably be around 300. So um, and there's other ones out there, uh, but this one's really user friendly. Um, so if you are going to get one, uh, this one's quite good. But yeah. Um, another question we have, which is from Barry, um, it says, where would you get plans to build a bat box? Canadian Wildlife Federation <laughs> website. They, um, if you, if you Google them and then, you know, tag along the, uh, the bats with that, they actually have plans, um, to build a proper bat box. Yeah. And they're really simple to build too. It's not, not that, um, not too many materials that you need. Um, also, another question from Barry is, do different species get along? Uh, I think they probably mostly ignore each other. Um, <laughs> although there's definitely certain species. So apparently the silverhead bat um, isn't found as often in areas with big brown bats. So the big brown bat outcompetes them usually. Um, so, and the same with say the the hoary bat and the eastern red bat they have a similar ecological niche um so there's a potential that one of them will outcompete the other one um so yeah i mean other than that they they're quite separated out so they'll have different preferred roosting sites one will be in rocks one will be in the leaves one will be in the bark uh, and different hibernating sites some of them like the walls some of them like the ceiling so they kind of separate themselves out um, except for, you know, when they're feeding, it's a little bit more of a competition. Um, okay, another question. This is from Deborah. Um, small colony of bats decided to roost in our outdoor umbrella. Uh, not what we want. So we have taken the umbrella down and bought a bat house. How do we know if they will relocate and not go back to our umbrella if we put it back up? <laughs> Uh, it's a little bit tricky. I mean, usually once they find a place they like to go, uh, they'll go back to it. Um, so I'd say probably just leaving the bat box up for a bit, 
is probably the best thing. And maybe, I don't know if it's an umbrella you can close. Um, I guess maybe it's closed and they crawl up and when you open it, they're in there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's probably hard to make them go to somewhere new. Um, that's one of the things with bat boxes. Um, unless you seal up your house, uh, if, they're if they're in your house, unless you seal up the house, they're not as likely to go into a bat box. Um, but they may find their way in there and, and they might prefer it, especially if you're opening it a lot and things like that, they might realize it's not the best place to be. Um, so yeah, they, they, they might move to it, uh, but it's just a matter of kind of testing it out and seeing if they're, if they're in there the next time you put it up. Um, so a couple of other questions we have um, are about bats and rabies and what happens if um, a bat were to bite you? Doctor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if you ever, yeah, <laughs> if you ever get bitten by a, by a bat, um, which is very unlikely, the only time you would is if it's in your house and you kind of grabbed it, it, it would kind of might bite you. Uh, but the same with any other any other mammal. If you get bitten by them, um, you know raccoons and like that, you yeah doctor right away. <laughs> Just go get your rabies shot. It's not so pleasant, but it's worth it. So yeah, <laughs> that's the best thing to do. Um, our next question is from Joan, and it says, "How many babies are in abroad? Are they born hairless?" That's Roland's question. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so generally, one. it's uh, one. That is the main, the main way that they that they have a baby. Um, but sometimes it's twins, and occasionally it's uh, four. So it's not as as common. But um, yeah, and then some of them are born hairless, and some of them have fur on them. Uh, but they grow up really quickly. So they're born quite big compared to the adult, which is usually why there's one and in some species two. Uh, and then usually they're, they're already kind of weaned and ready to fly off by themselves within say 30 days. So yeah, they're born quite big. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, another question from T is, can we invite the researchers to come to our backyard to monitor for bats at our location or somehow add our location for bat monitors maps to collect data? Uh, at the moment, we're pretty full. <laughs> um, we have lots of different properties that we that have had to schedule a very tight schedule to get people uh, uh, the bat monitoring equipment. Uh, so at the moment, I don't know that we'd necessarily be able to get out there. Um, but maybe outside of the bat monitoring season, there might be more opportunities for, for things like that, more on a just a see what's out there kind of basis rather than actual monitoring. Um, but at the moment, we, we do have uh, it pretty much booked up <laughs> all the way through the, it's only a two month season. So it's June and July. Uh, so it's quite a short season to get everything uh, monitored. Uh, so yeah, it's a little bit booked up. <laughs> If, um, if I guess this is for for T, if next season the monitoring equipment's available um, and isn't being used at one of the uh, locations, I and Joan would likely be more than happy to come out with it to to have you uh, um, see how how the system actually works and what potential bats are there. But like Toby said. To, to add that in might be difficult. So I would certainly consider that for you. Yeah, and it is fun. You can see, you can see what's, uh, what's there right away. So uh, you can kind of, you know, everyone can see it, which is nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so T says that would be wonderful. <laughs> cool. um, so we have another question. Um, it's from Anne and it says, is there any cure for white nose syndrome? Not that we know of at the moment. So it's, there's not really anything uh, that we've known to cure it, although some of them do seem to be immune. So uh, like I said, a lot of these populations will go down, you know, 90 to 100% even um, at certain hibernation sites. But there are those few that are left over that seem to be able to, to um, resist it. So um, yeah, not, not that we know of at the moment. So the best thing we have at the moment to stop the spread is just trying to stop people from spreading it from cave to cave. Although a lot of it is spread by bats moving around themselves. Um, so it's more containment at this point. Uh, the bats in Europe and, and Asia 
already were exposed to this. Uh, so they obviously have immunity to it to some degree. So over time, they likely will get an immunity, but we don't have a, um, you know, like a vaccine or anything for them. Yeah. Um, another question, uh, they said, thank you for the class. Why is it only June and July for data? We seem to have bats here in Moonstone in recent nights of August. Uh, so a big part of that is, is that that's the best time. So when you're doing, when you're doing monitoring uh, for, for a species like bats, um, we want to make sure that we're getting the, the best information. So when we send a team out, we want to make sure that all of the bats in the area will be present and we're going to get a good snapshot of what's there. Um, so there are still some bats that will be active at different times. Um, and so, you know, some of them might have already left by August uh, and started to migrate south. Some of them might be kind of moving back to their hibernation sites. Um, so you'd definitely see them around. Um, but for that, you know, snapshot of June and July is when you're going to get all the species and you're going to get uh, the best data uh, from, from the actual monitoring. Um, sessions. So that's kind of why it, it's, it's focused in that. And the reason for that is because that's when they're, when they have their young. So they're, they're going around and, and they, they've got their maternity roost. So they're staying in the same place and they're raising their young. Awesome. So I think that's all the questions for now. I did just want to point out um, Grant Mask actually included two really great uh, links in the chat box of directions to build your own bat house as well as how to order a bat house. Um, so I can include those links uh, when we send out the last email to all the participants in case anyone is wondering and would like to um, see those resources. And we can probably include the uh, bat conservation guide and the, the best practices as well for, for people. It's got a lot of good information in there too. Awesome. And I just want to say, um, Joan and Roland, do you have any like advice for anyone who is maybe thinking about doing bat monitoring with the Conservancy in the future? Do you have anything to share with them? <clears throat> yeah. Um, <laughs> even if you don't like mosquitoes <laughs> and you have a fear of bats, you can overcome it. <laughs> if I did, anybody can. Um, be prepared. Um, through those months of June and July, the, um, the bugs are, are relentless. Um, and get yourself a headlamp. Um, they're quite beneficial and maybe a mosquito jacket. And um, yeah, if, if you can tolerate not using musk, that's great, but uh, I think it's highly recommended. I find that just getting the, the head net works really well and I usually just wear a long sleeve shirt a lot of times. So um, that is helpful, but I wouldn't deter anybody. It's, uh, I think the first time we went out last year when we had the, the headphones and we had to carry the monitor up on a stick, we still thought that was cool, but only one of us could hear it at a time. But once we've uh, got the new system, we can all hear it and see it and you'll hear us go, oh, there's another one. Oh, listen to that sound. Then they do sound different, which was really surprising to us. So that part of it makes it really cool. And I think like, like anything, when you're in the environment, you get over that anxiety. You don't, you know, you look for the bats flying around. You're not going, oh my gosh, there's bats. <laughs> and you just keep, you can see us in the videos, just all of us are swatting away the mosquitoes. <laughs> Along with, uh, with that, you, you do get a chance to hear uh, different wildlife, you know, the frogs, the owls, which um, I didn't know what it was until I recorded the sound and brought it to Toby and he informed me what it was. So that, that was really interesting too. And then we saw an owl the second time we went out last yeah. year. So that was cool too. Definitely uh, give it a go. Awesome. So Toby, um, T is also wondering if, that you can, if you can include the name of the monitor unit uh, when we send out that email. Yep. Yeah, we can definitely do that. And it works on any Android or, or um, iPhone. You just have to get the right one. Awesome. So, yeah. Okay, great. So do you want to go to the next slide? Oh, yeah, sure. You have the last one. That's, and David, that's my job. <laughs> we can finish up. Let's see if I can put him off mute. Oh, there we go. Oh, David, one sec. I just have to unmute you. 
Sorry. Can I do it from here? You might just have to unmute yourself. I don't think I can do it. Oh, there you go. You're good. There we go. Okay, before you leave tonight, uh, we want to remind you to keep an eye out on our website uh, and social media for more monthly webinars and kids' activities. Thank you to everyone for attending, and a special thank you to Toby, Joan, and Roland for presenting tonight. Until next time. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we'll also put the recording of this webinar on our YouTube. Um, and we will also send that link out to all of you in case you want to watch it again or share it with friends and family. Good. Okay, take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the invitation and the good work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>